One does not simply walk into Mordor. The land of shadow. Hey everybody, uh, today's shadow cast is of course about all things evil in episode five, The Partings. Um, I have decided to go ahead and sort of refocus these breakdowns on all things that are evil in each of the episodes. Um, and I think that way I can focus more on the uh, dark servants of shadow and the dark domains and the theories behind uh, how those are being portrayed in the show. Um, I think it'll also help getting them out quicker. So anyway, uh, if you like this uh, new uh, breakdown and new uh, approach and focus, uh, let me know in the comments section uh, what you think of it. Um, so if you guys are ready, uh, let's go ahead and delve deep into all things evil in episode five. Let's begin. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. This shadow cast begins in Rovanion in the vales east of Anduin, where the mystery of the stranger only deepens. This set of scenes has a wonderful montage of images showing the migration of the Harfoots with a lovely song sung by Poppy Proudfellow. We see maps and locations, but it's hard to follow exactly where they are migrating. However, I captured this map here from episode one, which shows a larger area. This is what will eventually be called the Brownlands in the Third Age, but before it is blasted and destroyed by Sauron. It was here that Treebird said the Entwives were lost. It appears they travel in a rough circle from season to season throughout this area. In this episode, we see more of the stranger, but there is still no definitive answer as to who or what he is. It looks like the entire first season of the Rings of Power is all about a rising threat in Middle-earth. But really, isn't it about where is Sauron? Or should I say, who is Sauron? In my opinion, this episode eliminates both Adar and Halibrand as Sauron, but I'll get to that later which leaves us with The Stranger, or a yet unknown actor who will soon be revealed. The opening scene shows The Stranger sitting with Nori, and she talks of all the perils along the road of their migration. He asks her if he is a peril. She tells him emphatically that he is good because he helps. He seems doubtful. In a later scene, we see the wolves attack the Harfoots that we saw from the trailers, and the stranger comes to their rescue, showing the full might of his power. These wolves remind me of the wargs in the Lord of the Rings films, a hybrid of sorts. These are a sort of mutant wolf in the front and a lion in the back. These creatures seem pulled more from the films rather than the writings of Tolkien. I'm not a fan of these brazen beasts as yet. The stranger is injured by the effects of his own power and heals himself in a pool of water. The ever-curious Nori gets hurt in the process. She runs away in fear of his power. This is the last we see of him in this episode. It is my belief that the stranger is still the strongest candidate for the Rings of Power's version of Sauron. I'm not sure why I think that yet, um, because every time there's something in the show that makes me think he is Sauron, they show us something that maybe th makes you think that he could be uh, one of the wizards. 
So I still not 100%, but he still is the main candidate in my mind. In the next scene, we get our first look at the Morgoth worshipers. I plan to call them Goths, Morgoths, uh, for short. We see them standing on the cliff that we saw from the trailer. What we find out, though, is that they are actually looking down into the crater where the stranger fell. I was surprised to discover they were also in Rovanian. I was under the impression they were Numenorean, but they are apparently descended of the middlemen. Perhaps they are connected to Halibrand's people. Hmm. We see the Goth priestess placing her hand in the ash where we see the footprints of the stranger. In this episode, she is named the Dweller. Hmm. On the cliff, we have the woman in armor, and she is called Nomad. And the woman with the silver plate is called the Aesthetic. If you look closely, you can see the stranger's star map on the back of the plate. This is very interesting. The Rings of Power executive producer Lindsay Weber said that these characters have traveled, in quote, far from the east, from the lands of Rune. This is unexpected to me, and I just came across this. This is all we see of the Goths in this episode. They are searching for the stranger, and I sort of have this theory that they may be the ones who remind him that he is Sauron. Um, we know that Sauron was sent back to Middle-earth with the opportunity to either choose good or evil. Perhaps this is that moment. Next, we see Adar staring up at the sun. An orc comes up to tell him that the tunnels are complete. He tells the orc to expose his arm, and we see how the sun burns their flesh. Adar laments the fact that there will soon be a darkness that covers all these lands and he will no longer feel its warmth. I think that Adar is talking about the igniting of Mount Doom, whose ash and smoke will cover all the lands of Mordor in darkness. It may be that the power of the Black Blade, made by Morgoth, will be used to ignite the fires of Orodruin. Just a theory. Then we move on to the Tower of Ostirith. Bronwyn, with the help of Arondir, convinces the people who have taken refuge in the tower that they must stand and fight rather than submit to Adar and the orcs. But then the sneaky little Waldridge finally reveals whose side he is on. He tells the people that they will die if they do not follow him. A good half of the people, including the young Rowan, leave the tower and go to pledge their allegiance to Adar. It is full dark when they come to the orc camp. Waldridge bows before Adar, calling him Sauron. Adar nearly kills him for this sacrilege. He tells him his vow must be made in blood. He grabs Rowan and holds him. An orc tosses Waldridge a knife and poor Rowan begins to beg for mercy. For a second, Waldridge looks like he might refuse, but then his eyes turn evil. We don't witness this final act, but I have no doubt what happened next. Now, Adar doesn't deny that he is Sauron, but my gut has told me all along that he is not the Dark Lord. For me, this scene rules out Adar for good. We move back to the fortress where Theo tells Arondir about the black blade he has been hiding. Arondir says he has seen this image before. He goes to a spring that runs down over the rocks within the fortress and reveals a carving covered under vines. We see the black blade sacrificing a villager. Arondir tells Bronwyn, the blade is a key. It's an interesting choice of words. He says, the blade is a key 
conjured by some forgotten craft of the enemy to enslave your ancestors. He tells her that Adar spoke of becoming a god and providing a home for the orcs in these lands. He knows that Theo has the sword, and he is coming to claim it, he tells her. A key to unlocking the power of Mount Doom, maybe? Maybe. Then we watch as Adar gathers thousands of orcs and leads them up the mountainside to the tower. A great scene. Next, we move on to Linden, where the show may well break the Tolkien canon completely. We see Durin sparring with Gilgalad in traditional dwarven and elven fashion, while Elrond and Celebrimbor try to keep the peace. However, it is after the meal that the show drops the cannon bomb. Gilgalad and Elrond have a harsh back and forth about who has been lying. Gilgalad asks Elrond to recount the song The Roots of Hithyglir. Elrond says it is merely a legend of doubtful origin. A key point, I think. The song tells the tale of one of the three lost Cimmerils that was hidden in a mighty tree. A pure elven warrior battles an evil Balrog, light against dark. Lightning strikes the tree, and it travels to the roots of the mountain, forging their conflict into a power. Gilgalad believes the dwarves have discovered this power in the form of Mithril, an ore that contains the light of the lost Cimmeril. Gilgalad then shows Elrond the mighty tree that is now covered in a black fungus, which he says is a manifestation of the dying light of the Eldar in Middle-earth. If they do not return to the blessed realm of Valinor, they will die as mortal men. If they leave the shores of Middle-earth, however, then evil will take over these lands forever. A difficult choice indeed. It's a beautiful tale that is told in stunning visuals. Unfortunately, this story exists nowhere in Tolkien's writings. Thus, the cannon bomb. You have been told many lies of middle earth. The three Cimmerils are all accounted for in Tolkien's writings, so I can't see where we go from here. Now, there is the possibility that this tale is simply a lie. Adar says very clearly to Arandir, You have been told many lies. Some run so deep that even the rocks and roots believe them. Could he be talking about the roots of Ithaglir? Hmm, we'll just have to see. This presents a real problem for me, because once you veer off of canon so dramatically, it changes everything that comes later. For now, I'm going to put all this on hold and wait to see how this all unfolds. Let's hope the writers bring it all back to canon in the end. There is another moment where Celebrimbor apologizes to Elrond about keeping all of this secret from him. He says that he knew his father, as he had mentioned earlier in the last episode, and says that his father made the right decision for his people. This feels a little bit like manipulation, but he seems honest in his desire to come clean about keeping this secret from Elrond. The episode ends in Numenor. There is a lot that goes on there that I won't touch on here. There's a great deal of character building. There's a lot of father-son family drama between Elendil and Isildur, uh, Farazan and Kiman, also a budding romance between Elendil's daughter, Arian, who is a new character, and Kiman. There is also a fun scene where Galadriel shows off her fighting skills earned over thousands of years. 
In so doing, she earns the respect of the people of Numenor. However, the two main things that happen are when the queen regent tells her father she is going to Middle-earth, and he begs her not to, because she will only find darkness. Another reference to the coming shadow of Mount Doom? Maybe. The second thing to mention is the reversal of Halibrand, who finally comes around. Halibrand tells Galadriel that it was not only his ancestors who aligned with evil, but he himself has done terrible things. Galadriel then shares her own story of heartache and betrayal, that her own people could no longer tell the difference between her and the evil she pursued. She begs him to come to her aid, which he does. We also see where the fortress of Astirith is located. It is in the southwestern area of Mordor, along what will soon be called the Mountains of Shadow. The show ends with a rousing march to the ships, where we see men, horses, and weapons being loaded for bear. Galadriel gets a wonderful entrance as she boards the ship. Three of the five ships set sail across the harbor in a beautiful and epic scene that sets the stage for the coming battle. In closing, I just have to mention the stunning visuals in this show. From Numenor to Linden, from the Misty Mountains to Mordor, it really is on the caliber of the Lord of the Rings films. However, the cracks in canon appear to be widening. And that is very troubling to me. But I want to watch all eight episodes before making any final pronouncements on this subject. And I'll do this in my final season one review. Okay, uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, latest breakdown. Um, I got this one out a lot sooner. So let me know if you want me to continue uh, doing the breakdowns in the format that I just sort of laid out in this last one. Uh, let me know in the comments section below. So, until next time, where we are standing together on the plateau of Gorgoroth, waiting for Mount Doom to erupt in fire and flame.